Good evening, Open Door family. Very thankful to be up in this pulpit tonight. I'm very thankful for our wonderful man of God, our pastor, to allow me and all these other men to be able to bring a fresh word every day. I'm very thankful for that. I think it's awesome. And I also want to speak to you. Maybe you're not a part of our church. I've never been here in the sanctuary before. I want to let you know you are very welcomed. And we thank you so much for tuning in tonight. And if you want, just go to our Facebook page, hit a thumbs up, follow it. You can get all the words and all the, uh, the wonderful encouragement that you can get. And you can also go to our website, theopendoor.church, and you can find everything about our church, what we believe, our history, everything. So we'd really appreciate that. But tonight, I want to, uh, to talk about the blessings that we're desperately seeking after in this time. And I just want you to take one second, just one minute, and think to yourself, what is the most important blessing, the most important promise in my life right now that I am desperately needing, that I'm searching after? it. Maybe it's your family. You need a blessing in your family. Maybe you need a healing. Maybe you need some type of financial assistance, something. Right now, more than ever, we need a blessing. And sometimes it takes a little bit more than a quiet prayer in our closet to get the attention of God. Sometimes he requires us to go deeper, to seek him in a deep way, to praise him, to worship him in a very intimate matter, to see him literally face to face in order to get the blessing. And I want to take us through a journey tonight to figure out how we can seek him. How can we? When we have so much going on, we have our past looming over us, haunting us every single day. On top of that, we have things in our future, responsibilities, especially in this time, a lot of uncertainty for our futures. We have nowhere to turn, and at the core of our humanity, we realize we are imperfect. Everything we do, we nitpick and we can see the mistakes. We look up to God and we know we are not worthy. We disqualify ourselves every second of the day. We have all this mixed in together. And it's hard to come to God and say, bless me. Give me this. Give me my promises. It's hard. But I want to encourage you tonight on how we as a people together in unity as a church we can receive our blessing. So everything that I'm going to be talking about tonight, you can find it in Genesis 31 and 32. I'm going to be talking about Jacob. And there's a moment where God speaks into Jacob's life. And for 20 years now, he has been with his father-in-law Laban. And he has been working and he has been starting a family with two of his wives, Leah and Rachel. He has 11 sons at this point. He has a lot of wealth. He is blessed beyond belief. But God speaks into his life and he says, I want you to go back to your home country where you came from. And in this moment, I'm sure there's some uncertainty. There's some things in his past he doesn't want to go back to. But he yields to the word of God. But there's a, an obstacle in the way. He knows Laban, his father-in-law, will not let him probably. Because Jacob is over his whole land. The reason reason why Laban is so blessed and so rich is because of Jacob's presence in his land. And for so long, Laban has deceived him and tried to keep him there. But this is the moment where Jacob's going to listen to God. And he escapes during the night without telling Laban a word. And he escapes and he sets up camp waiting for the next day. And Laban catches wind of this. And goes and finds Jacob. Now watch this. Whenever Laban gets there, he's making a scene. He's throwing a fit. He's like, how could you? And you got to understand, this is his father-in-law. It's not just an employer. Jacob has taken away his only two daughters. He's taken away some of his wealth. He's taken away his only grandchildren. So respectively, I mean, of course, he's going to be offended. He's wanting to to bring them back. And he's trying to tempt him. He's saying, I'll give you anything. Just come back with me. And in this moment, we can see ourselves. This is the moment where our past comes up behind us and says, "Come, come back with me. Come back. 
to when these people used to make fun of you. Come back to all the hurtful things that people have done to you. Come back to the things that you have done. Come back and live here. And a lot of the times when we are tempted like that, we, we go back. We allow the enemy to pull us in and suck us in and we, we, we have a pity party for ourselves and we are totally consumed by our past. But there's a moment where we have to focus on the one thing and that is our blessing. That is the promise of God. Jacob's life has a blessing, has a promise of God over it. That he is going to be the father of many nations that was carried down from Abraham to Isaac to him. There's a blessing waiting on him in his home country. And he's not going to let it go. So he tells Laban, I, I can't. I understand why you're mad. I understand. But I, I can't go back with you. And in this moment, it's like God mends their relationship with a snap of his finger. Laban begins to understand and they actually make a covenant right then and there. And they embrace and they say their goodbyes and they separate. See, when we focus on our blessing and our promise, it's like the past just fades away. It just comes off of us. Chains just break loose. It's not an aggressive thing, but when we focus on the promise, it's just natural. We just step closer and closer to our blessing. Now, just when we think that he's out of the, the, the clear now and he, he's okay, Jacob has another problem waiting on him. His brother Esau understands that his brother's coming back home. So he sends a servant to go greet Jacob. The servant comes into the camp of Jacob. Jacob sees him and the servant speaks up and says, your brother Esau is coming to see you with 400 men coming in. Now Jacob, if you don't know the story of Jacob, the reason why he left his home country in the, to begin with was not a happy ending. He was a conniving, thieving uh, child. He stole the birthright from his brother Esau. He stole the blessing from his brother Esau. Everything that Esau had for his future, the potential that he had, it was taken away by his only brother. And the last words out of Esau's mouth before Jacob left was, I vow after I, I, I grieve the loss of my father, I'm going to kill my brother Jacob for everything he's done to me. So those words, that, that speech given that, that day, it's ringing in Jacob's brain. He's understanding that his, his past is catching up with him, but this also represents the future things that are coming up. The uncertainty. Is he still mad at me? Is he going to come and attack me with 400 men? Better yet, is he going to kill all my, my children? He's going to kill my family. There's so much uncertainty. There's so many things in the future. We can see ourselves standing in the same position, maybe not with a mad brother trying to kill us, but with so many things, uncertainties staring across the horizon when it comes to our job, when it comes to money, when it comes to relationships. At this time, more than ever, they're being tested. Uncertainty is trying to consume our heart and our mind every waking moment. There's an interesting thing that Jacob does in this moment. Before he, does, he sends gifts and he even sends his family on a different route, but before he does any of that, he lets out a prayer. And he prays with this uncertain prayer, which, I man, I, I just resonate with so much because he's real in this moment. He's not making up some elaborate prayer. It's a real thing. He speaks to God saying, I'm scared. My brother's going to kill me. He's going to kill my family. But he keeps reminding himself, I have the blessing of God for my future. I know what you have given to my grandfather Abraham. I know what you've given to my father Isaac and it's bestowed upon me. You told them that their offspring will be outnumbering the sand on the seashore. It will be too numerous to count. You told me to leave my own country. You told me to leave, to go. 
in this prayer, he's, he's hyping himself up. In this prayer, he's raising his faith. In this prayer, he's letting his words go before him into the future. He's letting his praise, he's letting his faith, he's letting all these things go before him to challenge all the uncertainty, to challenge all the doubt, to challenge all the fear. And in this moment, we have to do the same thing. We have to pray with a, a fervent prayer and let our words go before us. The Word of God, when we read it, we got to read it with some, some passion. With some intention behind our voice. We have to read it like we are putting ourselves in a situation. When we pray, we pray with all of our heart. When we worship, we worship with everything that's in us. And it might not seem on the surface that we're getting anywhere or something is happening because we don't see it. We don't see the words coming out of our mouth. We don't see what's happening behind the scenes. But we, in our faith in Jesus, in our faith in God... We understand that these words are not in vain. These, these prayers are, are not powerless, but they are mighty through God. We can't see in the Spirit, but in this moment, when we let our words and our praise and everything break forth, we are breaking strongholds in the future. We are breaking things that are coming after us, and we're changing situations with one spoken word, with one loud boisterous prayer we are changing the actual future in this moment we have to face it head on we have to go after it and jacob does this and he sends the gifts forward he he sends his family forward he's hoping everything's going to be okay now in this moment he's left alone he's sitting by himself it's late at night and the story just gets kind of weird. Just that Old Testament theme. Just weird stuff just happens all the time. It says that a man comes up on Jacob and starts wrestling with him. And it's not just a tiny, just a few minutes. I mean, it's, it's a continuous wrestle. It's a fight. Almost like a fight to the death. And Jacob is uncertain who this is at this point. And they're wrestling. They're, 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 they're go and the Bible only gives us this. This phrase that he's a man. As we go forward in the story, this man touches the socket of Jacob's hip or his thigh and it dislocates. So now we see almost like this divine nature man, maybe an angel, I don't know. But there's some significance with this hip and that's for sure. See, if we go to Genesis Chapter 24, we go all the way back to Abraham. Abraham sends his servant to find his son Isaac a wife. And when he sends his servant, he says, place your hand under my thigh or my hip. And maybe in that day, in that culture, the, the hip represented a covenant. We see that in that moment. And once we see Jacob's hip dislocated, that is symbolism for a broken or a disjointed covenant or commitment. We can actually see this in Numbers chapter 5 be a true thing. Uh, in Numbers, it's, it's kind of going over some laws, some rituals, and some things. And th there's a perfect uh, symbolism for us that when a woman is suspected of being uh, an adulterous woman, cheating on her husband, she has to be brought to the sanctuary. In the tabernacle of God. And what they would do is they would have a pot full of water. They would take dust off of the tabernacle floor and put it into the pot. They'd stir it up. And in the presence of God, in the presence of the Ark of the Covenant, they would make the woman drink the water out of that, that basin or that pot. And when she would drink it, it was a bitter drink. It, it was dirt. It was just dirt water. Now, it's said that if she was innocent of the crimes, maybe it was just rumors, then nothing would happen to her. But if she was guilty, now listen to this, she would not die, but her belly would swell and her hip or her thigh would fall away. 
So in this moment, we understand now that the hip, it represents a covenant, it represents a commitment, the keeping it. And by that example of the adulterous woman in the Old Testament law, when we fast forward, we see ourselves, that we are the bride of Christ, that we are supposed to desire God, come after God. We're supposed to flee from sin. But guess what? We fall short of the glory every single day of our lives. We sin and we sin and we sin. And, and even Paul and many of the writers, they, they accept this fact that in humanity, even when we accept God, we accept the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, we suffer in the sinful world and we give in to it in temptations all the time. So in this wrestling match, and in this moment where this divine person touches Jacob's hip and it dislocates, it represents the sin in our life, our disobedience to the commitment and the covenant with our relationship with God. See, when you get so close to God, it reveals that sin. See, sometimes we can come into church and we can act like, you know, we're okay because we don't have like the big ticket item sins in our life that we can see on the surface. But in reality, when you get so close to God, when you're seeking after Him with all your heart, especially in a bad time, all that sin that's inside of you, that pride, that jealousy, that lust, everything that you try to hold back and act like you don't have it, it is revealed. So in this moment, this is a representation of when we are face to face with the divine presence of God, when we are searching after the blessing, our sin is going to rise up. And guess what? It's going to try to take you away. It's going to try to disqualify you. You're going to think, well, well maybe, maybe I, I'm not right for this blessing. Maybe I'm not going to get it because I'm not right with God. I, I don't go to church every Sunday. I'm not praying like I should. I'm not reading the Bible like I should. None of us are. We're all falling short of the glory. We all have sin in our life. Even me, even all of these people that, that might act holy. We all fall short of the glory of God. But in this moment, you can't give in to that disqualification. You have to press forward and be like Jacob. See, in this moment, after he dislocates his hip, they're still wrestling. He didn't give up. He keeps fighting. And eventually, this man yells out, Hey, day is breaking. Stop. Just let me go. And Jacob says, I won't stop until you bless me. In this moment, we kind of understand who this divine person is, maybe. That this person was God manifested within a fleshly body, which is crazy to think. And how Jacob knew that, I don't know. But in this moment, he understands that, that this divine person, this godlike figure is here, and I'm going to get my blessing. That all these things that are happening right now, all these things that I'm running away from, all these things that I'm going towards, and the overall promises in my life, they're going to come to pass. And I'm not going to stop until you touch me, until you pour your spirit all over me, until I see your glory. And that is when automatically the fight is over. And this man stands before Jacob. He says, what is your name? And he says, Jacob. He said, no, your name is no longer Jacob, but it's Israel. Because you have struggled with, wait, struggled with God and with men, and you have prevailed. See, in our moment of weaknesses, when our past tries to take us over, when our future tries to hold us back sometimes, and when our sin tries to disqualify us, if we continue to push and to persevere, we don't have to be perfect in the pursuit, but when we continually go day in and day out, we will find God. He will meet us face to face. And He will bless us with our promises, with things that are, that are in our way. He will help us and guide us through these times. See, after this encounter, we see Esau come towards Jacob. 
And Jacob at this point is, is falling on his knees. He's scared. Even after with his encounter with God and his name change. But Esau gets off his, his horse or his cattle and he comes and he embraces his brother and they, they weep in each other, their, their arms with each other. There's a love there. There's a connection. And in this moment, Jacob's mind is blown. And he gives glory to God, exclaiming, Man, I have seen the face of God. And I survived. He brought, he brought these things through that I thought were impossible. I thought I was going to die when I saw my brother. He brought me through that. I thought Laban was going to hurt me. He brought me through that. And I know the blessing, the promise over my life to be the father of many nations. It is here. I accept it. See, we want a quick prayer. We want that, that automatic answer from God. But sometimes He's testing our relationship to get us to face these obstacles, to face these things, to see if we're willing to go the extra mile to see Him. To seek Him diligently. And when we are able to struggle, not only with men and circumstances of the world and our society and our culture, but actually be able to struggle with the Spirit of God. That we fight and we fight until, until, until we get our blessing. And I want to encourage you, whatever your blessing is, remember in the very beginning of this, I told you, what is the blessing you want? What is the promises that God has made to you that you need to come to pass now? In this moment, I want you to begin to pray. If you are not in a position where you can pray, I want you to at least think about it and meditate on it in, the, in this moment. If you can write it down or something, that would be great too. But in this moment, we're going to pray. And this, this is just going to be the start of something beautiful that God is going to do in your life. That you are going to seek Him with a, different, with a different passion. With a different hope. And right now, this, this is a turning point. Not just for one person. Not for you know, a few people. But for a church. For a group of people. A body of people that are willing to turn their face. From all the things of this world. From all the things that are happening in our life. And focus on the will of God. He is going to supply the blessing and the promises that we so desperately need. So wherever you're at, whether you want to raise your hands, if you want to bow your head, it doesn't matter. Let's all pray together in unity, and I believe that God is going to do something so great and manifest in your life. So Lord, I pray over every single person watching this. I pray, Lord, over their situations. I speak, God, faith and favor right now. Lord, there's so many things going on that I, I can't even comprehend people are going through. I speak God blessings over families and financial situations. Lord, over sicknesses, over emotional and mental problems. God, I speak it, God, right now that you are the author and the finisher of our faith. That you have the last word. That you are our strong tower. That you are our refuge. Lord, you are also my shield and my great reward. I speak it, God, right now. Lord, that we press past our past. That we look forward to the future and we speak positivity. We speak these things into existence and change things. And we begin to deal with our sin. Not to just ignore it, not to just take it away, but deal with it and not let it disqualify us. And to go into the presence of God like we never went before. I speak it in the name of Jesus right now that you restore your people. That you would restore a remnant of people that have went away from church right now to draw their hearts, God. I speak it in the name of Jesus that you are worthy and you are good and you are awesome, God. And we have our faith that you are going to bless us. And promises, upon promises, are going to come to pass. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I want to thank every single one of you for watching tonight. I appreciate you. And I hope, I hope, I hope to see all of you very soon. Hey, this is Pastor Chris and Vonda Sowards. We just wanted to say thanks for watching today. 
you liked watching our services, I know you'll love coming and worshiping with us here in Charleston. To find out more information, please head to our website at theopendoor.church.